Um, so I think everyone deserves good care, and that's what kind of underpins my effort in that area. And you know, there are other benefits of working in different settings. I think that. Um, the hospital in uh, Labrador is nice because where it's so small, I know all of the uh, referring doctors. Um, yeah, I know them quite well, actually, as well as some of the surgeons that we work with. So medicine is really a team sport. So it's important to be kind of on the same page and to be accessible with uh, the other doctors that you work with because many of the patients, we, we co-manage them together. So there are lots of, you know, lots of benefits in working in that setting. Okay. And I know that you played a lot of sports when you were younger and you're talking about uh, medicine being a team sport. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so why did you choose medicine? Well, there are a number of reasons why I chose medicine. I, the, the big thing is I always wanted to help people and I saw medicine as, as a way to do that. Uh, and the other thing is I was always interested in people's stories and just um, learning more about people. And I think a lot of, you know, a lot of medicine is communication. I think a lot of people think, you know, the medicine and the science, and of course, you know, that's the, the foundation is the science and, and the knowledge. But, you know, if you're not a good communicator, then it's hard, it's hard to be a good doctor as well. So I thought it was nice because it really marries, you know, my different interests in, in health advocacy, communication, communication with my individual patients and with kind of patients on the whole. And of course, the, you know, the science and seeking the truth and doing that as well. All right. Yeah. Well, that's great. And um, now I know your father is a medical doctor mm -hmm. and uh, you chose to go into dermatology as opposed to maybe oncology or cardiology. Why specifically that? Uh... Well, dermatology, I think there are a number of uh, unique benefits. So, for example, I really enjoy the diversity of the cases that we see. So, you know, in the morning I might be dealing with skin cancers and in the afternoon I'm at the hospital treating severe drug rashes and then we see common things as well acne psoriasis um, eczema so i think the just the variety and the different cases that we get to manage it's really important to me mm. uh, other benefits of of dermatology are most of our diagnoses you make just by looking at a patient you know you look at a patient sometimes you'll have to feel the the lesion um, so before we, you know, we don't need um, biopsies and x-rays and, and blood work and this and that. We just look at the patient most of the time, uh, determine our diagnosis, and then, uh, you know, come with them help to come up with a management plan. So that's uh, really appealing as well. And then another major thing was I get to treat both children and adults, which is nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the other medical specialties focus on one or the other, but dermatology, um, you know, gives me the range to treat all sorts of patients. Well, that's great, and we're glad that you are a dermatologist here in our province, because mm -hmm. when our daughter was younger and we took him to the doctor one time, I, we was, we'd stayed up all night and she was itching, and so when we went, the doctor says, well, I, I can't really tell chicken pox on a black skin. Mm -hmm. So he really couldn't help us, you mm -hmm. know, for sure, what was going on. So it's great to have someone like you who can mm -hmm. work in, you know, a diverse group of cultures. That's right. So that's, I'm glad you brought that up, actually. So when I was in... Um, uh, UBC for my training, I actually spent some extra time in, in London in a clinic called London Ethnic Skin because I, I think that, you know, as a dermatologist, again, treating all patients, you should also treat patients of all skin types, right? So patients with really light skin to patients with quite dark skin and everyone in between. So we find that a lot of, you know, dermatology textbooks, uh, because when dermatology was, was created, our population isn't as diverse as, as it was today. Mm -hmm. So a lot of dermatology textbooks will focus more on the lighter skin because that's just the population that was around. So since I thought that, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to have that kind of blind spot, if you will, so I purposely mm -hmm. went out of my way to, you know, to make sure that I was um, seeing patients of all skin types because I knew when I was going to come back here to practice dermatology, I wanted to be able to help patients of all, you know, different uh, skin types. So you were talking about your training. You mm -hmm. had to leave the province mm -hmm. uh, to train as a dermatologist. And so tell us, where did you do that and what did that entail? So, yeah, so I, I did my medical school here and I was actually quite, quite involved in the medical school. I was president of the Medical Student Society and I spearheaded the accreditation efforts in medical school. And we did have full accreditation uh, when, I, when, you know, when I graduated in 2013. But since I uh, wanted to do dermatology, I knew that I had to leave the province because we don't have that training here. So, uh, so the plan was to go to the University of British Columbia. So I was in Vancouver for five years. And you know, it was an excellent time. They have, you know, have world-class uh, facilities, uh, researchers, and clinicians teaching me. So it's great to be able to get that training and of course to bring it back here. 
and, and besides my training in Vancouver, which was the home base, I spent some time in London, as I mentioned. I spent some time in tropical dermatology in, in Vietnam, and I spent some time in a refugee health clinic, as well as a clinic in the, so what they call the downtown east side, which is actually one of the poorest neighborhoods, in, not just in BC, in all of Canada. And I delivered dermatologic care there as well, because I think, I think it's important to kind of meet people where they are. So rather than having them come to the hospitals, it's easier for me, instead of working at the hospital, to go to the clinic, you know, right mm -hmm. in their community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are some experiences and, and some skills that I can bring back to Newfoundland. So I had, you know, had a great time in Vancouver. And, you know, and besides, uh, you know, work, it, I'd be remiss to mention I met, I met my wife in Vancouver <laughs> okay. uh, and we got married there, actually. She came back uh, to Newfoundland with me. So, yeah, it's been great. Yeah, that's good. Now, you mentioned earlier that um, in your lecture series, you talked about diversity and working with various skin types. And mm -hmm. so can you elaborate a little bit on that? So the well, the 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 lecture I gave the faculty was mainly um, about diversity in medicine and in academia and about some of the, the, the barriers. So um, both diversity in terms of ethnic diversity, but most of the talk was actually about women in medicine. Um, you know, the further you go in terms of leadership, we'll have uh, fewer women will be, will be represented. Um, just one quick example, 17 medical schools in the country, only five have ever had a female dean. Um, and you know, fortunately, Memorial University is one of them. We have our current uh, dean is Margaret Steele. But um, so when I talk about diversity, it's both in terms of uh, gender uh, as well as you know uh, ethnic diversity. Uh, but in in London, where I, where I did my uh, training at London Ethnic Skin, uh, that was mainly based on seeing patients of all different skin types. Uh, so uh, you know, you mentioned the the case with chickenpox. So I think that. You know, when we think of chickenpox or things like eczema and psoriasis, um, you should ha you should know what it looks like uh, in all different skin types. Mm -hmm. So then, when you see it as a as a dermatologist, you know, you know, you should be able to manage them uh, regardless of what skin type the patient has. Right, and as our province becomes more culturally diverse and we have more people from diverse ethnic backgrounds, mm -hmm. then that's even more important. That's right. You know, that's that, right. Uh, all the doctors will at least get trained on mm -hmm. how to treat people from diverse cultural backgrounds. That's right, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's some you know some of the changes that are happening in St. John's, Newfoundland, and everywhere. You know, globalization and and, and di diversification. So I think it is important that we kind of keep our medical training up up to speed with that. Right. Yeah, and which is what you're doing as well. Mm -hmm. I don't really know where you find the time to do all of that, <laughs> <laughs> but you are very busy. Mm -hmm. And um, now, if we're thinking about uh, um, sharing our cultures, we engage high school youth mm -hmm. to give them opportunities to learn skills, academic skills, mm -hmm. and to think about their post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. And now if some of them want to go into medicine, what would be mm -hmm. your advice? Well, I think, um, you know, compared to maybe several decades ago, I think as a profession in medicine, we're realizing that there are benefits to diversity in terms of, um, you know, urban versus rural background, um, socioeconomic status, um, gender device, diversity, ethnic diversity, uh, indigenous status, etc. So really there's room for everyone in our profession. So I think that's uh, very important. Uh, I do think that, you know, medicine is, is academic, you know, the, the training is long medical school, and then there's specialty, whether you choose family medicine as a specialty or another one like myself. Uh, so of course, you know, you have to, you know, just demonstrate that you are, you know, uh, capable of, of doing all the academics. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people know about the academic side of medicine, but there's a lot of uh, medicine in terms of, um, you know, communication with folks, advocacy for health, um, and, you know, and uh, empathy as well, and leadership. So those are also important skills to have as a doctor, and therefore also important for folks to consider if they, you know, want medicine as a career. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, What's, what's nice is that there's many different ways you can show that. You know, some people will spend time in charity, some people will volunteer in a hospital. Um, I talk about medicine being a team sport, so if you're right. you know, <laughs> it's, it's doing things in sports or music or what have you, I think there's lots of avenues that you can show that you can take, you know, learn a certain set of skills and apply those to be a doctor. All right, and uh, so whilst they're in high school, mm -hmm. do they focus on specific subjects? So I, uh, yeah, so I went to Booth Memorial High School. Uh, I did a lot of science and math. I was always interested in, in science and math. I, you know, extra, I did extracurricular science fairs. Uh, some people called me a mathlete because we would take part in uh, kind of a, 
think it was a, a Eastern School District-wide <coughs> math competitions. So for me, I was naturally interested in that anyway. But I, uh, it's interesting because when I went to undergrad, I actually did a double major. So I did a major in sociology mm -hmm. as well as a major in medical sciences. So I think that in many ways, uh, medicine is an art and a science. Mm -hmm. So I, I chose to do a little bit of both. So I, I don't think it really matters mm -hmm. um, you know, how much of one subject you do because they do, for medical school, they, they do teach everyone as if you don't have any of the medical training, right? right? So just find something that you like and then it's easier to you know, study for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We're going to have a short break, and when we come back, we're going to find out what life was like for you growing up in the West End of City of St. John's. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I have with me Dr. Ogunyemi the only African-Canadian dermatologist in the province. Now, you were the only student in your class from Africa mm -hmm. when you were growing up. What was that like? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's actually not something I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about. Um, that's right, so it was me and my brother who was always um, a, a year ahead of me. But, uh, you know, we did the, you know, hung out in the same groups and uh, played on the same sports teams and, you know, the same kind of gallivanting, um, <laughs> traveling uh, on the weekends as everyone else. So for me, I thought that we had a lot more in common, right, with mm -hmm. our people in our neighborhood and people in our classrooms, et cetera, uh, than things that were different. So, so honestly, it's not something I spent a whole lot of time uh, thinking about. Uh, but I, I mean, one, one good point, so certainly <laughs> it, uh, you want to stay out of trouble, right? So if you're identifiable, you want to stay out of trouble. But I'm just kidding. That's and that's yeah. something that, that that we we typically did anyway. That's right. But uh, you know, you know, I mean, I had a, you know, it was great kind of uh, growing up. I had a great childhood. So that's not something I spent mm -hmm. a whole lot of time thinking about. It was almost a little bit of a default for mm -hmm. for me because that's the way you know that was the way it was when we came here for for kindergarten and this and that. Right. That's right. So yes, your parents came here when you were well, much younger, mm -hmm. about three. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you were living in Cowan Heights, were there other children there from Africa or you were the only ones? I think we were the only ones, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we, yeah, we've been there, you know, about 30 years now. My parents mm -hmm. still live in, in the West End. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, th things are changing now, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, things are definitely changing now. I think it's a lot more diverse, you know, all around the province, certainly yes. in St. John's and mm -hmm. the, the greater St. John's area. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, back then I think a lot of the Africans knew most of the other African mm -hmm. families right. around, yes. you know, yeah. your family and, right. yeah. and, and many others. But mm -hmm. now, you know, now, now there's a very large community. So it's kind of nice seeing that, that change, you yes. know. Yeah, right. I remember what you just said there uh, about you had to be careful not getting into trouble because mm -hmm. we used to always tell our children, now their school was over by the Avalon Mall. Mm -hmm. And we used to say, you're not allowed to go to the Avalon Mall because if you go there and something happens, then you'll be the first ones they'll pick out <laughs> of the crowd. <laughs> So we always had to uh, to think about that, but now it's so different because it's so culturally diverse, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so schools a little bit different even today in terms of the population. Mm -hmm. So what was your experience actually in school? I know your brother was in the same school mm -hmm. as you were, but um, did you see yourself represented in the school? That did you have any teachers from Africa or mm. principals? I don't know that I did. I think again, I think the province was more homogenous back then. You know, this is the 90s we're, we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I didn't think that we were represented as, as much. Mm -hmm. But so again, part of it is, you know, a lot of our family friends, and, and I think for a lot of people when they go to a new community, a lot of the people you'll meet that will reach out to you will mm -hmm. be other, you know, Africans or, or Nigerians. So we, you know, we kind of had a, a bit of a, um, you know, kind of the best of both worlds in, in, in a sense. So, you know, at home, especially when we're younger, we'd eat a lot of Nigerian foods and, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, Nigerian uh, customs. And then when we went out to school, we're just like, you know, j just like everyone else, right? And it's funny when kind of growing up, because my brother and my sister and I, you know, are, are you know, Canadians first. So 
we'll, uh, and, and so are my parents, but we'll say, sometimes we'll, we would say things like, well, mommy, you know, mommy in Canada, this is what they call it, right? So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and then mom, you know, mom jokes, she's like, we're the ones that, that brought you here. But, yeah. you know, for us, we're used to saying, you know, in Canada, this is what they call it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it's, you know, it's kind of interesting having that. You know, I think it's good to, to appreciate um, other cultures than we did because, mm -hmm. of course, we, you know, came from Nigeria. But, uh, but of course, I think we, it was really easy for us to, uh, you know, to get integrated into the society here. Right. Um, you know, all my, you know, friends were, you know, were great growing up at, at a, you know, a, a big diverse group of friends growing up. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, 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 it wasn't an issue at all. I know, you know, other people have different experiences, but yeah, growing up was fine. I just felt like I was one of the guys and, and still feel that way, actually. Right. Yeah. yeah, well, that's great. And um, well, now you're here, you have uh, a young daughter, mm -hmm. Eliana, I think mm -hmm. what, she's about how old is she now? Months. Well, she's 10, ten months, months now, yeah. right? That's an exciting age. Yeah. And uh, what would you want school to be like for her? Well, now? I think, yeah, mm -hmm. now, well, I, I, again, I think my schooling and childhood was great. I was actually very, you know, I, I love going to school. Uh, so I was very happy. And, well, I, I did enjoy summers as well, but, you know, I was very happy when September came around and yeah. back to school and seeing friends and getting in the routine. So I think that, you know, of course, impressing, eventually pressing upon her the, the importance of school and the importance mm -hmm. of, of balance as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to just, uh, you know, take uh, opportunities, especially opportunities that that you know might not seem uh, like they're they're up your alley, but it, I think that's where most of the growth occurs. Mm -hmm. In fact, so I, I gave a TEDx St. John's talk um, about the edge effect, and so that is an idea that I expressed to her. So the edge effect gets its name because it's at the intersect of two distinct ecosystems, like mm -hmm. the savanna and the grasslands, at the greatest number of unique organisms that can be found. So I think that applies to humans in real life as well. So I mm -hmm. think that when you meet people with different, you know, from different backgrounds or with different perspectives, then, you know, a lot of creativity and innovation can come from that. So I think it's important to, to you know, to keep an open mind and to take advantage of different opportunities, especially growing up in school, you know, it's a very safe place mm -hmm. to do it. So I took part in, you know, sports and music and drama and student council and public speaking and, and you know, a little bit of all those types of things. Right. Uh, and then it's just a great time to kind of, you know, find what you like to, to explore, to adventure. So I think the main thing is just her to just keep, a, keep an open mind, uh, you know, look for different opportunities and don't kind of write things off. Okay, thank you. Now you're a prolific writer, mm -hmm. um, not only of academic journals, but you've also written in uh, national and provincial um, magazines, mm -hmm. newspapers. And um, what has been your passion in writing a lot of those articles that you've written? Well, you know, I think it's just, just communication. I think it's just important um, to communicate. Um, I, it, it's a bit of both, I think I do have, some of it is a duty, I think some ideas, you know, with my position in medicine and so on, uh, I think it's important to communicate it with folks. And the other part is also a passion. You know, I, I personally like uh, to write uh, as well. We talk, you know, I did an arts major in, in, in undergrad. So, so it's, it's a little bit of both. So for example, um, you know, a lot of my work, most of my work probably is at the intersection of health and uh, diversity and social justice. So I think those are important mes messages to share. I think that, uh, you know, I, I do have a unique perspective there's not many, um, you know, Africans, I think, that have been in Newfoundland as long as I have. So I, mm -hmm. I think that I can kind of speak to both. So both, um, you know, how it was, you know, Newfoundland is, is a great place for immigrants to come. And I mm -hmm. think that I, um, I just like to use my platform to, to, to get that idea out, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So hoping to get more, you know, more people c contributing to our province, not just economically, but also, you know, culturally contribute to the fabric of our province. And I think it's important. Um, you know, diversity, equity, um, inclusion, and anti-racism are important ideas that I like to, to write about, it, as you mentioned. So whether it's the New York Times or the CBC or the Huffington Post or the Globe and Mail. So those mm -hmm. are some of the, the avenues that I've been fortunate uh, to be published in and just uh, sharing those ideas that I think need to be heard. You studied in BC. You met your wife mm -hmm. and you got married. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there were many opportunities, many places in the world for someone like you with the training you have. Mm -hmm. um, why did you choose to come back to the province and work here? Well, so, so my wife's also a, a physician and we made the joint decision to, to come back. So for me, you know, Newfoundland has always been home. Uh, so it, 
you know, it, it's, it's kind of an easy decision in, in a lot of ways. You know, my, my family's here, my first memories are here, my fondest memories are here, and, um, you know, all my friends are, you know, most of my friends are still here, uh, and, and if they're not here, they regularly kind of come back to visit, so it's nice uh, to get back into that feel. Um, and, you know, versus, you know, my wife's from Vancouver, you know, it's a much bigger city, but if you're in St. John's, if you're around town for a day, there's there's no way you're not going to run into someone you know, or some you know sometimes someone's parent or someone you knew from kind of growing up. So, so for me that's really nice and important. So if that was a factor in in coming back. Uh, you know we have a strong medical school here, and I'm happy to take part and get on faculty and contribute as well. So those were some of the factors bringing me back. Now you know to be honest, the, the weather's not as nice as it is in in BC, so that part was a bit of a tough sell uh, for my wife. But I'm glad that uh, I'm you know certainly glad that we came back, and she loves it here as well. Mm -hmm. So um, if someone's thinking of uh, relocating to the city or coming to the city to stay here to work and raise their family, what sort of um, advice you'd give them, like based on any challenges that you faced or ways in which they could prepare themselves before they come? To St. John's? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, someone coming to St. John's for the first time or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so, so. Well, you know, I think I think St. John's is a, is a is a great place to live. It's a great place to, to raise a family. You know, I was raised here, and I plan to you know raise my daughter here as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I I think it's an excellent choice. I think we do kind of have a mix where we're you know we're 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 big enough. We have the airport. Um, you know, things are getting more and more diverse, right? right. You know, yeah. the, you know. I mean, a lot more diverse now. We have the international. Uh, mm -hmm. farmers market etc so you can see you know different parts of the world represented right, right here in the in the city so i think that we have those benefits but we're still small enough you know mm -hmm. and we're safe uh, you know for example you know uh, dr fitzgerald and the rest of the team did a great job handling the the pandemic so i think there are a lot of benefits so we had the benefits from being small but we also have some benefits from our you know from our size as well so i think it's a, it's a great place i think it's um, you know, I'm very happy for the future of, of the city mm -hmm. uh, and the province as well. Right, because now we have a new premier That's right. and uh, things are going to uh, change a bit. Mm -hmm. So do you see areas in which the city could improve or the province could improve in how they welcome newcomers to the city? I think I think the province is actually doing a good job of that. For example, I know organizations, the Association of New Canadians and your organization, Shin Our Cultures, are there's just there's a lot of programming. Um, you know, I, I've I've been to many of the events. I, well, I actually spoke at the Atlantic Immigration Summit a couple of years ago, but I've been to the diversity summits. So I think there's a lot more resources actually than when we first came. Yes. From what I understand, I know. For example, I think you and, and my mother and a few other women started one of the first African associations yeah. in, in the province, right? So yeah. that's, I don't know, late 80s or maybe right. probably yeah. early 90s. Yeah. So there's, you know, from that kind of one small group to now there's many organizations and they, mul mm. they both have multiple, or they all have multiple kind of areas that they're helping people right. integrate. Yeah. I think it's, you know, I think it's great. Uh, you know, in my field of medicine, there's a refugee clinic as well right. so you know specifically for for their needs and helping with translation with translation and so on mm -hmm. so i think you know there's more and more uh, uh, resources here so i think it's mm -hmm. a great but at the same time we're we're still also true to our heritage right okay. so you know the ocean has been very important in newfoundland culturally certainly economically right, right? Yeah. whether it's getting mm -hmm. fish from the ocean or getting oil from the ocean or, or just being near the ocean in our view so I think that that's important to keep as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's certainly been a pleasure having you here on Chair in Our Cultures today. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, I do remember those uh, times when we uh, met with your parents and we're putting together the African Association and so much has grown since then. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I really want to wish you all the best in your work mm -hmm. and your travels. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much again for being with us today. Well, thanks for having me. Okay. You're okay. Welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks to Dr. Bolu Ogunyemi and to you for joining us today. Join us again next time as we share more remarkable stories of individuals from around the world who've come to call this place home.
The following program is brought to you by Rogers Anyplace TV. Enjoy exclusive content for free. Visit RogersAnyplaceTV.com. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Well, uh, we filmed the tape I found, when we were I online. I found the tape when um, we were doing a routine exercise to find more potential projects for our company. This could be our next movie. We think he did kill somebody. Adam and I are going to go and look for this guy. Operation Smile, alongside our medical volunteers, provides safe cleft surgery to children free of charge thanks to generous donors like you. That was until we fell into a pandemic. If you only knew what I'm going By December, tens of thousands more children will be waiting for surgery. Please help us keep our promise and deliver smiles to children in need when surgeries resume. It's okay to hit a financial rough patch, and it's okay to get help. I'm Ian Penny of Janes and Nosley, and for 35 years, we've been getting people in our province out of debt. Janes and Nosley, licensed insolvency trustee. It's okay. The following program is brought to you by...